As the oil spill continues to spread in the Gulf, we wonder what does this mean to all of us living in the Gulf Coast region? Is the cleanup plan working? How do weather and tide patterns affect the damage and the recovery? And what is the economic impact we can expect to feel from this disaster? Tonight, oil, the Gulf, and us. I'm Ernie Manus, and this is Houston 8. As oil continues to seep out of the deep water horizon offshore drilling rig, quickly making this the largest crude oil spill in U.S. history, we are reminded of the dangerous game black gold drilling and transporting remains. In 1979 in the Gulf of Mexico, exploratory oil well Itak 1 blew up, spilling approximately 140 million gallons of crude oil into the open sea. 1989 gave us the Exxon Valdez, which hit an undersea reef and spilled over 10 million gallons of oil into the waters off of Alaska, which, up until now, was the worst oil spill in U.S. history. A pipeline rupture in Rio de Janeiro in 2000 spewed almost 350,000 gallons of heavy oil into Guanabara Bay. That same year, the oil tanker Westchester lost power and ran aground near Port Sulphur, Louisiana dumping more than half a million gallons of crude oil into the lower Mississippi. And 2005's Hurricane Katrina was the cause of more than 7 million gallons of oil spilled from various sources, including pipelines, storage tanks, and industrial plants. These are but a few examples of how drilling and transporting oil remains a dangerous game, one we continue to play. Joining us tonight are Ken Medlock, a fellow in Energy and Resource Economics, Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. Aaron Studwell, Senior Meteorologist, Weather Insight LP, and the President of the American Meteorological Society, Houston Chapter. And Tyler Priest, Director of Global Studies at the Bauer College of Business, University of Houston. Welcome to all of you for coming. First of all, I want to start off with what exactly are we dealing with? What happened and when did this happen? I'll start with you, Tyler. Well, this was a British Petroleum uh, semi-submersible drilling vessel, the Deepwater Horizon. Uh, it was drilling at about 5,000 feet of water in a place um, off of Louisiana called the Mississippi Canyon, and they had an uncontrolled blowout, um, which released formation oil and gas. <clears throat> and the gas. And when you say a blowout, just so I can understand what happened, the rig is down. There's a there's what we see on top of the water. They had finished um, drilling an 18,000 foot well, so through 5,000 feet of water and then another 18,000 feet. Okay. They had finished drilling it. They were in the process of temporarily plugging it and abandoning it. And then they would come back later and probably produce uh, from the formation. And in that process, something happened. Uh, the formation pressure built up and came up through the, the well bore and through the blowout preventer and up into the drilling vessel and ignited and, and, and the flames eventually engulfed the whole drilling vessel. Okay, so, and I'm trying to understand this because I know very little about drilling. We, we, have, we see what we see on the surface and don't really understand, I think, all the time what's going yeah. on below. So they go down, they drill, this, they have, they're capping it, that's what blows out. Is this something that's a natural occurrence that would happen regularly, or is this something that is unique that we shouldn't have expected? Blowouts happen. I mean, they, are, they happen in the industry. Usually they're not that severe. And they usually happen when they encounter a shallow gas pocket of some sort okay. that, they, that they weren't anticipating. It wasn't part of the, the objective that they were trying to drill to. Okay. The, this was coming from, you know, the reservoir. Um, and it's, there are a lot of theories about what happened and what went wrong. Um, we really have to wait until we find out the results of the federal investigations as to exactly what happened. But now, uh, if I understand it, there's not just one leak down there now. There are three of them. Well, One's been capped Well, already. what happens is uh, there's, you know, there's, there's the well bore, and on top of that is the blowout preventer, and then on top of the blowout preventer is the marine riser. Uh, where the drill pipe goes down, and when the when the um, when the the flames engulfed the rig and it sank, the riser bent over, and there are three different leaks on the riser. Okay, will this naturally stop flowing, or does man have to intervene somehow? 
there has to be intervention. To or stop else this. what would happen? I mean, there's, there's a possibility that it could sand up the, the well and breach and, and stop flowing itself, but this is a pretty high flow flowing well right now. Um, so uh, it looks like the, the, you know, the best uh, way to stop this would be to drill these relief wells and where they will drill two wells down and meet uh, where meet the bottom of where the original well was and pump mud and water or possibly cement down to s stem the flow and then they would probably come over and and um, and pour cement down the original well, now, well bore. Now, Ken, all of this though is taking a lot of time. Absolutely. What's going on? What can we expect to happen immediately to stop problems? Uh, immediately very little. I think uh, those options were uh, more or less exhausted um, with regard to uh, you know some of the, the, the submarine efforts that were ongoing to try to get those blowout valves to close. Um, but uh, there is an effort under, undergoing, uh, underway right now where they're trying to actually put this dome structure. You guys might have seen some of those reports where um, basically what they're going to try to do, and this has been done on shallower formations, but never in 5,000 feet of water. So it's, it's an untested hypothesis at this point. Uh, but the idea is you'll actually drop this, uh, um, this tower, in effect, down over the, uh, uh, over the leak and try to capture it that way and basically direct the flow to the surface uh, via this tower. Um, so that it can actually be uh, collected rather than spilled into the water. So um, uh, they were, uh, I think the latest report was they're going to try to do that uh, within the week. So mm -hmm. that's really, I think, in the short term, our best, our best hope for actually having this stopped. Now, we always refer to BP now, and I've heard and I don't quite understand exactly, BP owned it, did not own it, leased it? Well, they're actually, uh, it's a joint venture. I think it's BP, uh, Anadarko, and Mitsui, uh, okay. or, but BP is the operator. So um, um, that's largely why they're, they're brought up, A, they're the biggest company involved, but B, they'll be the operating company. So they actually negotiated the leases with Transocean and with Halliburton at all. Liability-wise, though, who carries the most responsibility for this, or are there such as acts of God and things happen that you are not liable for? Well, mostly with the operator. BP, it, BP and its partners obtained the lease from the federal government. And, you know, they got a permit to drill and explore and develop this lease. They hired Transocean to drill it for them. And so there's usually a contract between the operator. I mean, there is a contract between the operator and the drilling contractor. Um, and, I, and I believe in cases like these, the operator is responsible for catastrophic losses. Um, and so BP is is ultimately responsible. Okay, now while all of this is going on, we have to be concerned, I am assuming, with the weather, what's yes. going on in that area. It's going to change where the slick goes. It's going to change how their uh, effects to try and stop it are going to work. What's going on over there? Well, right now we've had a very nice latter, latter part of this week, very quiet. Winds have been down, waves have been down. First part of the week, we've, uh, they struggled, 15-foot uh, waves in parts. Uh, what we see happen then is the oil the water goes over the booms, the booms detach, the booms get lost. Uh, we can't release the dispersants through the uh, aerial, through the airplanes. So now we're stuck in a situation where you're just kind of watching and waiting and it's being transported with the wind. And we have the currents, but the winds are also kind of directing it. So first, before we get into exactly yes. where it's going all that, so we've got the leak and the oil's coming up and it's forming this massive slick, which somebody said is about the size of Connecticut, I heard today. Um, this nature will step in eventually and clean it up? I, yeah, if we left it in the water, I don't see that being, it'll eventually kind of settle out and mix out. But right now, as, it's, as we continue to release it, as we continue to look right around the deep water horizon area, you see those heavy patches and those moderate patches. And it's just going to continue until we get it capped off. And so now, as they spread and shift, they are, of course, coming toward land. They are doing uh, catastrophic things to the aquatic life that's out there. If a hurricane were to wipe through this area, and we are heading into hurricane yes. season, what would that mean for all of this? It's a, you know, we can't just say one general answer on this one. So you'll have a lot of different scenarios. How big the storm is, where does it form, where does it go in? Worst case scenario, the eye wall or the eye goes just west of Deepwater Horizon. We could see the rough seas pick up oily water, actually transport it onshore within the storm. We could see... Um, it being all rural containment and dispersion efforts being just stopped because you can't get a boat out there, you're everybody evacuating. 
Uh, you'll see storm surge push that further onshore as we move the shore, as we move close, the storm moves onshore. Uh, the storm, storm surge is my largest concern because mm -hmm. with we see these storm surges now on, say, a Category 1, we'll see a storm surge of 4 to 6 feet. And that's not 4 to 6 feet inland, that's 4 to 6 feet up. So we now have these barrier islands in Plaque Mines and St. Bernard Parish and also along the uh, Mississippi coast that may just be covered and inundated with oily water. Now, as most Americans usually are, this story is happening today and by tomorrow we'll move on to something else. This is going to be a long-term cleanup, and it could be a problem all throughout hurricane season, yes. correct? How long are we expecting for a cleanup of this size? At, if they were to cap it this week, how long of a cleanup would we still have ahead of us? Any kind of estimates, guests? Well, I think probably the nearest, uh, nearest end example we could look at is, is some of the spills of petroleum products that we saw after Hurricane Katrina which was referenced in the opening. Um, you know, there were, I guess, there, there were some stories about how uh, uh, some chemicals were added to the areas where the spills occurred and uh, to, to sort of force those to settle out faster. It, it turned out that those, those regions did not recover as quickly as where they did controlled burns. So the answer to your question is really how do we actually approach remediation? Um, so I think the lessons we learned from Katrina where we can actually do controlled burns even in marshlands, uh, we saw the ecosystems recover a little bit more quickly. So I think that's probably what would occur here. And I hear that talked about on the news, but what does that mean? So you light the oil and then as soon as the burn is gone, it's gone too yes. and we've cleaned up. And so it takes just as long as it would take to burn the oil that's there, correct? Uh, that's more or less correct, yeah, but then you've got to allow the ecosystem to recover. That's the other thing. So in terms of the time for that to take, I mean, you're probably looking at a couple of years at least. Well, and you're looking at a very sensitive ecosystem that's yeah. already under stress, yeah, the Louisiana marshlands, who been, which have been um, disappearing at an alarming rate for decades. And, uh, you know, they're, they're heavily stressed right now. Yeah. And this, this could tip them over the edge. And my other concern with a controlled burn, and I do recognize that is the best way to handle it, is the combustion products from these controlled burns, especially in marshlands. You're now putting those combustion products back onto the land into it. So you can have an environmentally sensitive area and a lot of things that are carcinogenic. And I recognize it is the best way to do it, but it is one more concern that's for an area that's already struggling. Sure. Yeah. And I go back to a part that I just think we don't grasp the severity of this problem those of us sitting in our armchairs at home, and to understand how long this will impact us. And it won't just through the environment impact us, but also through the economy. And I'm curious, this amount of oil, and somewhere I heard 200,000 gallons a day are yeah. coming out? Five, or 5,000 barrels. 5,000 yeah. barrels a day. Yeah. Is this a significant amount of oil in the, in the oil industry to be losing in a day? Would this affect gas prices and all of that down the road, or isn't it really that much compared to what goes on in the world? Well, I think the, in terms of its effect on prices, um, it's not so much that the oil is leaking because, A, this was an exploration rig, so it's not actually affecting active production lines at the moment. Um, where I think it, it could pose a, a potentially much larger problem, it's not necessarily the lost barrels uh, five, ten years down the road. It's what sort of regulatory uh, repercussions emerge from this. So uh, are there uh, tighter regulations imposed on offshore drilling where we have, actually have uh, the capability to, so the western and central gulf? Um, and if so, does that actually substantially raise costs? And if so, does that re result in more rapid declines in oil production offshore gulf? That's where these sort of things begin to, to, to mount up. So um, it's tough to say at this point. Yeah. And just to give some historical perspective, um, the Ixtoc well that was mentioned at the top of the show uh, flowed at an estimated rate of, um, I think, 7,500 barrels a day. Uh, that was the official PEMEX, esti Pemex estimate. Um, there were other estimates that placed it almost 30,000 yeah. barrels a day for nine months. So that was the biggest of all time. Right. And um, I don't know if the rumors are true that um, th this could flow at up to 60,000 barrels a day. Um, apparently, BP admitted that in a, in a meeting yesterday. So, I mean, that's, the, that's a potentially worst case scenario. When we talk about regulations that were mentioned, are there things that could have been in place? I heard in other countries they have certain things, uh, mechanical devices that work with this. So if this kind of an accident happened in other places, it might not have been as... Serious. Is that well, I've heard a couple of things. Um, Norway and Brazil require a, an acoustic 
um, backup uh, shutoff for the blow blowout preventer, and the U.S. does not require that. Although it's not clear whether that would have worked in this case. It, it may have sent the same kind of signals that the ROVs uh, have done and failed uh, to shut off. So um, those are two specific things. Um, the regulatory environment in the United States is on health and safety is not as prescriptive as it is in the UK and Norway and some other places. Um, the, the MMS, the Minerals Management Service, uh, which is the agency that leases offshore, federal offshore territory and regulates the industry, um, does inspections. I think they did like 16,000 inspections of the 3,500 platforms in the Gulf last year. But it's mainly a compliance um, kind of um, regulation. They, they license activities and ensure compliance with uh, equipment and, and operations. Uh, but, they, but they don't have a, a, a mandatory health and safety regulation. It's a voluntary system. And I'm not sure if, if the, uh, a mandatory system such as they have in the UK or Norway would have made any difference here, um, but I think if, in any kind of new regulation that's going to come out of this, that is what we're going to see. Is a is a man, some more a mandatory system of health and safety, and an environmental protection regulation on these platforms. But then, with new regulations, new costs makes it more expensive. Makes it potentially, harder. potentially. Now, you know, it's it's tough to say company by company because there are some companies that have very very good records offshore that actually have very stringent internal safety regs. And BP, so. I think, was considered to be one of these. It was it's not considered an unsafe operator in the, in in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. And uh, on the on, on the note about um, um, MMS doing inspections, you know, it's a department. It's it's a division within the Department of Interior. So all this falls under Ken Zalazar's ultimately his his purview. But uh, there were reports that the Deepwater Horizon had actually been inspected as, as recently as April first. And typically these things are supposed to be inspected before they begin or commence an operation like this. So um, it's tough to say at this point whether or not this was a fault of you know improper maintenance or anything like that because we just don't know. We have to wait for for the results of any kind of federal investigation to come out. It was clearly uh, a series of failures, yeah. mechanical failures, which are rare mm -hmm. offshore. I mean, it, that used to be part of an earlier era where you were, they were just developing all the new technology and it was, you know, um, very innovative but very experimental. Um, in the last 30 or 40 years, uh, you know, you don't see as many mechanical failures leading to these kinds of incidents. Um, most problems are the result of human error, and that requires some kind of internal controls, mm -hmm. um, uh, safe, health and safety programs um, that vary from, from company to company and mm -hmm. leasee to leasee. Yeah. I want to go back to the economic impact also for a minute. Uh, well, actually, and before I go to any of that, I just want to say, and there's no question tied to it, we also want to recognize that there were lives lost in yes, this. Yes. And uh, 11 lives were yeah, lost, correct. as I understand. And it seems that in a lot of the coverage, that gets forgotten, and we do realize that that happened too. Back to the economic impact. So not only do you have what would happen in the oil industry, you've got the fishing industry and all that. What happens in a situation like this? What's going to happen to that part of the Gulf, to that coast, to tourism? How is this all going to play out, do you think? Well, I think this year um, you're already seeing it play out. Um, I, I think in terms of uh, uh, oyster harvest, shrimp harvest, uh, typical fishery catch, those things are going to be severely damaged. And uh, that, of course, will play itself out in terms of the price we pay for raw oysters at, you know, at, at the local restaurant, so on and so forth. But um, in terms of the livelihoods for the individuals involved, really their only means of uh, compensation is, is through, uh, through the legal system. And I think you're already seeing that begin to play itself out. But certainly this, this is going to have an impact this year. And depending on how far inland this oil moves and how, how, how devastating it is to the, to the ecosystem, it, it could play itself out over the next several years. Yeah. If a hurricane were to come our direction through the Gulf, could it affect the Houston area? Could it affect Galveston in that area? Or is the, the distance such that we wouldn't be bothered? It would depend on the track. I and mean, if we saw a hurricane like Andrew where it came across South Florida and then kind of skirted up, you could see like the northern bands of that start to affect and push that hour away where you'd see it, say, landfall was near High Island. The upper Texas coast would be impacted, could be potentially be impacted by that. What would we be seeing? What would happen if, in fact, a hurricane with oil-slicked water comes across land. 
I, you know, Sabine Pass, uh, up in the northern part of High Island, you can see oil uh, up on shore for 10 feet, up 10 feet or over, even over the island in some lower spots because if we have a storm surge for a storm to come across a very open fetch of the Gulf, it's capturing all that water and kind of pushing it along ahead of it. The, there is one small benefit of it is in that choppier water. We do see it's a natural dispersant process, but I think if we're at a point where you're saying worst case scenarios, it could be very devastating for now. We're, only looking, we're looking now at eastern Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, but now the entire Louisiana coast and even portions of the Texas coast. All right. Now we talk worst case scenario. What's the most probable course that's going to happen? Well, looking at the climatology for June, we do see a lot of storms form in the western Caribbean Sea and then move over to the eastern Gulf. That is the most likely path right now uh, for any kind of hurricane. We are seeing the waters in the western Caribbean start to warm up. The potential for storms, if there's a specific me measure for it, is higher now south of Jamaica than it was last July. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at a scenario where if we just happen to get a wave or some kind of development, a stalled out tail end of a front, um, now over and we have a low develop over the um, central Caribbean Sea, the most likely path is for that to go over the eastern Gulf. And that would be uh, another devastating scenario depending on its track. Um, we're planning on going to the Florida Panhandle this year for vacation. Um, you know, they're already talking in Pensacola and down to Fort Walton looking out for the oil slicks as we go further into the season. It's, that'd be a path and a track that would take it that way. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's look to the future then. Let's assume that what they're doing right now, that, that that capping object that they're putting down there does work. What time frame are we going to see then cleanup happen? How soon would this no longer be a problem? Because I think in my mind, I think, oh, well, then they'll burn it off and we'll be fine. How long does something like this take? And if they don't cap it now, where do they go next? I'll leave it to either of you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Uh, I think it's tough. It's tough to answer that question because we don't actually know the extent to which uh, the ecosystems involved will be affected, um, and that's really the the if then part of the question. Um, you know, if you paint worst case scenarios, then again we're talking it could be several years before this is the remediation efforts are completed. Um, if you're talking about a best case scenario where things sort of uh, you know, the weather turns in our favor mm -hmm. and, and, and this stuff naturally disperses and, and sort of drops out, then, you know, it, it could be fairly quick. Um, Give me an idea. When you say fairly quick, <laughs> I um, don't know what that means. I would say by this time next summer, say. Um, so we fairly could be in quick a very, this a is a year. very best case. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is not going to be gone by winter's time. Well, I mean, it's assuming it's, that they get this under control soon yeah, and exactly. it doesn't take three months to drill relief wells and and those, that drilling is not disrupted by hurricanes, and it may take a few more months. Right. The know. cap, I understand, that they're putting down there is the only one they have. Yeah, if it doesn't yeah. work, they've got to start. Well, it's on one area, the riser, and they're going to try to produce oil from the leak. And there are a lot of questions surrounding that, and there's not a whole lot of confidence. This is very experimental. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a, almost a kind of a desperate effort. So what if that doesn't work? Then what's the next plan? If you were sitting in the chair, what would you think is the next way to go? Well, I mean, it sounds like BP has a lot of different contingency plans to try to sh shut off the well. Um, but, uh, I mean, ultimately, if none of these things work at the, at the seafloor level and, and, with, and containing it, you know, with this, uh, this containment dome, Ultimately, what they'll do is have to drill these relief wells. And that could take yeah. three months. I believe months. they still have to drill the relief wells, even with the yeah. containment dome, because this yeah. is not a permanent fixture. Yeah, it's not going um, to. So, yeah. so in, in terms of the, the efforts to contain this, I mean, this is, this is, you know, a mitigation effort, if you will, the containment dome. But the relief wells are still a necessary step here. And unless they can find some way with the ROVs that they have down there to, yeah. to activate the blowout preventer, um, it's going to keep blowing. Wow. And so we're going to continue to see probably 200,000 or more barrels of oil a day. Not, not, not gallons. Not, gallons, yeah. Yes. Of oil a day. 50, yeah. what would you say? It could go up. 5,000 barrels. It could, go, 5, could go up. It could go down. We, and they, they yeah. really don't have solid numbers on what is actually coming out. Yeah, the, the concern, the, the, the number mentioned earlier of 60,000 barrels, that's a, that's a worst case scenario, if you will, where, where there's actually a complete blowout at the wellhead. And that um, could still could still come. It, there's a possibility. I think it's deemed by most people involved remote at this point, but it's something they're worried about. 
Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming in and talking about this uh, tricky situation, especially with it still developing as we oh, talk, yes. too. So uh, I hope you'll come back, and we'll all have good news when, when we see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Now, each week we invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Simply click on the local programs bar, pick Houston 8, and then you can join our online community. You can read about the guests, learn more about the topic, share your thoughts and ideas, and even suggest questions that we might ask during upcoming episodes. Remember, information posted on our website may be used on air, so keep that in mind when submitting. That does it for us tonight. Until next week, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thank you for watching, and have a good week.